I have the very distinct honor of introducing our, our, our guest speaker here today, uh, Senator Gail Harrell. Uh, Senator Harrell has served um, in the legislative process since the year 2000. She served a full full, full eight years uh, under the term limits, took uh, two years off, right, and then came back into the House. And then uh, the good wisdom of the uh, Port St. Lucie and St. Lucie County area residents, amongst others, voted her into the Senate, where she's been uh, since 2014, 2018, sorry. Uh, Dates matter. Um, in the House and in the Senate, she has uh, served in a lot of different varieties, but she is, because of her background, also a good gator. Um, she has a lot of experience in the healthcare industry, so she served on a lot of healthcare committees, which I know is of interest to many of you in the room. And certainly, it, when you serve it, that many years in the legislative process, she's touched insurance issues, budget issues, criminal issues, you name it. There's not much that Senator Harrell doesn't know about the process and the budget process. So she's been a wonderful member. Uh, we are going to be sad the one day she decides term limits is enough and she wants to do something else because we like having her around up there. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to to address you. First of all, I want to say thank you so much to Chris and to, uh, and to uh, FIT for inviting me here today. It's always a delight to come and meet with especially people in the nonprofit arena. I have uh, many, many years involved in many nonprofits on the Treasure Coast, and I'm so delighted that we have two of our wonderful organizations, Mac Town and ARC from the Treasure Coast. Thank you for for being here, wonderful to see you all. And it's always good to come and see hometown folks when you come and, and uh, do a legislative update. But it, uh, I wanna just first commend you for what you are doing. I think being in the social service arena especially is extremely uh, difficult and many, many challenges. And I know as, as a, having been involved with many nonprofits, I'm a founding board member of Hibiscus Children's Center, a uh, shelter for abused and neglected children on the Treasure Coast. Also been involved with helping people succeed early on years when it was uh, Tri-County Tech. So I know the challenges as nonprofits that you face and coming together as a group like this to really bring your interests together and pull your resources to be able to buy insurance and work together is really a key way of keeping costs low. So I, I want to commend you for what you're doing and just encourage you to look for other ways to also share your information among each other and to uh, hopefully at some point you might even get into doing a uh, health insurance but I know that's a key driver a key expense that you all do have so by sharing your by coming together by being uh, self-insuring essentially or, or reinsur getting reinsurance and pulling your resources really makes it very cost affordable for you and I'm delighted that you're doing that. It's a, it's a good way for nonprofits, especially those we in government depend on, to be able to really provide the services that government doesn't do as well as you do. And I'm a firm believer in really the privatization of these kinds of essential services, whether it's community-based care organizations in the um, child welfare arena, or whether it's managing entities in the mental health and substance abuse arena. And in contracting with those providers out there, we let communities make decisions as to what is the best thing in the interest of their community and the best way to provide services to the people of that community. So uh, I know you have a tough job and I commend you for what you do. And I think that uh, this type of organization coming together really is a key way for you to be able to afford to do even more service out in your communities. So give yourselves a round of applause for everything you do. As, as a legislator, I'm a new freshman legislator in the Florida Senate. So I, I have found the bathrooms, key number one, find the bathrooms. And I, I am learning my way around the Senate. 
and I'm now one of 40 instead of one of 120. And that really changes the dynamics and how you get things done. And I feel that I have been totally empowered to really move uh, policy forward, especially in the healthcare side of, the, of government. Uh, while in the House, I was very involved in child welfare issues. I was children, chairman of Children, Families, and Seniors for over for six years. Now I'm chairman of the Health Policy Committee on the on the Senate side, and I do bring uh, some long-term experiences at 30 years involved in healthcare, uh, running a large medical facility for many years uh, on the Treasure Coast. So health policy is kind of what I do. So if my uh, my legislative update kind of swings to the health care, Rita, please, that's that's my area of expertise as well as the, the child welfare and mental health area. But it was a very exciting year. As a freshman, I was very excited to be in the Florida Senate. And it was a very successful year. We really, I think, moved the ball down very successfully. We had a tremendous budget this year, $91 billion. Those are your dollars that we are spending. And we made major advances both in education, in really the largest education budget we have ever had. We really put the money into the classroom, and that is to me the most important thing. And uh, environmentally, we did probably the biggest budget we've ever had environmentally. And of course, in my arena in, on the Treasure Coast, this is a key issue for us. So I felt I was so delighted we put over $649 million into Everglades restoration, which for us is absolutely key. But we also did across the state, we're really looking at water policy issues and really making sure that we have, uh, that we're putting the resources into uh, our environment because that is truly our future for our children. And when it comes to insurance, I know this is your field, this is why you're here, because you're pooling your resources together to be involved in insurance and to keep your costs as low as possible. One of the key bills that we did this year deals with assignments of, assignment of benefits. And that, of course, live insurance for property has been huge. We are the hurricane state. We do have hurricanes. We do have natural disasters that happen, whether it's sinkholes or um, hurricanes, floods, those kinds of things. So this, this section of insurance really can be uh, very, very expensive. And we've been looking over the years, we've done lots of things to uh, mitigate uh, insurance costs, especially back when we had the hurricanes in 2004 and 5, and insurance companies were leaving the state and you couldn't purchase, you could hardly get homeowners insurance or property insurance. So uh, we've made changes along the way. We started Citizens, we did a variety of things. But one of the things that we uh, didn't see happening, and it kind of snuck up on us over the years, is assignment of benefits. Does anybody know what assignment of benefits is? Anybody have any? We have a few people. Okay, if you have a if you have damage to your property, and you need to, you are you're trying to get it repaired. We've just had hurricanes, and you're trying to get it repaired. You're having perhaps some negotiation problems with your insurance company, uh, you have the option of assigning that benefit to another organization, usually maybe a contractor or an organization that then, in, that then contracts for you. And you are out of the picture. They do the repairs, they do whatever you need to do, they fight the insurance company. And you think this is a great idea. I don't have to fight this fight anymore. Well. What has happened over the years is that these assignment of benefit claims have escalated so. In 2006, I think we only had about 405 uh, in assignment of benefits. Over the last years, this has increased to over 34,000 this last year, where they have someone has assigned the benefit. And the costs of that, and then there frequently are lawsuits because whatever has happened, 
there's dissatisfaction and there's lawsuits. And this has led to a huge increase in premiums. And the, uh, we are estimating the Department of Insurance uh, Regulation, the Office of Insurance Regulation, has really looked carefully at that and determined that there's probably a 36% increase in premiums over the years because of this assignment of benefit uh, litigation. And for most part, it winds up in litigation and has driven the cost of insurance up tremendously. So this year, we that was one of the main insurance uh, aspects that was tackled, and I think we're very much on the right track in what we're doing, in really trying to rein in the litigation costs. And do we have any lawyers out there? Okay, then I, oh, we got one over here. Well, <laughs> does he have his recorder on? So, you know, that is a key driver in so much of what we see happening, whether it's liability insurance, whether it is homeowner's insurance, property and casualty insurance, whatever. It is a workers' comp, classic example of where the, once you get into that lawsuit mode and you get into the, uh, the uh, costs that are associated with that, you can see premiums starting to escalate tremendously. And that is what we have seen happen over the years. So this one of the, the way we really dealt with this this year was um, previously it was all one-sided uh, attorney's fees, where it was only the really the assignment of benefit company that could get the, the attorney's fees. Now we have eliminated that aspect of it. And these attorney's fees can be tremendously expensive. So we have really put in a, a, a way of limiting or closing down that huge award of attorney's fees and try to balance it out. In we want people, we want litigation to be used when necessary appropriately and not reward uh, frivolous suits, and that is the goal of this legislation, not to award frivolous suits. So I'm going to kind of look at the notes here to give you this. Okay, if the, when the settlement takes place, and we want these settlements to happen, that's the key. First of all, not wind up in court, but if you do wind up in court over this, that it settles as, as fairly as possible. And when the insurance company has made a, an offer to settle, and that offer was refused by the assignment of benefit contractor, then there's a, there's a process by which the attorney's fees will be awarded. So you don't wind up with excessive attorney's fees. And if the settlement differs, from, if the judgment differs from what the offer was by the insurance company, uh, less than 25% less than of the disputed amount the insurer is entitled to the award for reasonable attorney's fees. So the other side has to pay his attorney's fees. If it's um, at least 20, if at least 25%, but less than 50% of the dis disputed amount is awarded, then no party gets the other person to pay their attorney fees. Or if it's, if at least 50% of the disputed amount the assignee is entitled to the award of reasonable attorney's fees. So we're trying to balance that out. And the attorney's fees, you're not going to go into litigation just to collect attorney's fees. Also, we said insurance companies have to offer at least one policy that you opt out of assignment of benefits. And that price of that insurance must be less than if you have assignment of benefits abilities within the insurance policy. So we're trying to balance out this whole thing. And I think you will start to see the insurance, property and casualty insurance starting to come down because of this. And certainly that is our goal. Other things that we did this year that should impact, that should impact you and what you're paying for health insurance also is significant. I know you don't 
you don't pool your resources and you don't do health insurance, but it should help with your overall in the health arena is that we really started to look at how we're going to transform healthcare in the state of Florida and really trying to make it more transparent and more uh, patient centric. And for me as a healthcare administrator for many years, I always put the patient first. What do you do? How do you make sure as a state policymaker that the patient is always at the center of every decision we make? And we made major changes this year in, uh, in hospitals, for instance, uh, called certificate of need and making sure that hospitals, uh, that we have availability of hospitals, hospital services to to patients across the state of Florida. And we, the federal government back in uh, the 70s put in place something called certificate of need as a cost containment, uh, a, a way to cost to contain costs in healthcare. And they thought that if you limited the number of hospitals, you would be able to drive the cost down. And in fact, after about 10 or 15 years, they realized that was not the case. And we said that you had to and we kept certificate of need in Florida, and that said there could only be a certain number of hospitals in an area, and in order to get a certificate of need to build a hospital, you had to prove that there was the need for the new hospital. This created all kinds of, guess what, lawsuits. In fact, in my local community, we had uh, Barton Memorial Hospital and HCA were in a battle for probably 10 years over an open heart center. Maybe $20 million of healthcare dollars were spent in litigation. So the, we had to, we really looked at how we can change the system so that you don't have this kind of litigation going on. And what we're doing is moving everything into licensure as opposed to certificate of need. We eliminated certificate of need for general hospitals immediately this year. And over the next, and in two years, uh, we will look at specialty hospitals. And those will be such as psychiatric hospitals, children's hospitals, uh, maternal infant care hospitals. Those certificates of needs will go away in two years. But we did say that the rules under which certificate of need were determined would stay in place under licensure until uh, for tertiary care procedures like open heart and neonatal intensive care units. They would stay in place until new rules were written. So we put some safeguards in there. And we also prevented uh, the ability for hospitals to come in and kind of cherry pick and take just those high uh, the procedures that are very high paying and suck off all the insured patients and leave our general hospitals with the uh, with just charity care or Medicaid so we're very careful in in preventing what they call boutique hospitals from coming in and doing that so we're on the way in really transforming healthcare. We also put in place certain uh, other as in several other bills that are going to impact again, hopefully, and reduce the costs to you of healthcare. And one of those that I think is so important, and for those of you who do uh, mental health and substance abuse, I think will be key. And that is the telehealth bill that we passed. And that is allowing, that really is defining what telehealth is and truly bringing us up into the 21st century so that you will be able to use, especially in mental health, where you will be able to use providers via telehealth. And so that psychiatrist doesn't have to be in the office there. You can use a psychiatrist, if, especially if you're in a rural area, you can use one in Jacksonville. You could even, with specific types, with a specific way of being certified, you can use that 
telehealth provider in Atlanta, for instance, and out of the state of Florida. But we made sure we did it very, very carefully so that all those providers had to meet the same standards of a professional here in the state and be held accountable here in the state if that individual happened to be out of state. They would have to get a special certificate from the Department of Health in order to provide those services here. Uh, I think that will give uh, us access, especially to those areas, those specialties that are so difficult to fill in the state of Florida. And our rural areas, especially, will have access to really uh, those specialties that, they, that are not in their communities. I think that's probably uh, one of the most exciting things for me was to, because I do a lot of health IT things, that's kind of my little niche. So I think that was very, very helpful. Another bill that I think is really going to have, uh, that's going to impact insurance costs, another reform that we did this year that is really going to impact the bottom line for you providing health insurance is what we call the health care reform bill. And that had a, was a multifaceted bill that really made significant changes in, um, in transparency and again, putting that patient first. If someone is on observation status in an emergency room and they are, they may be moved into another section of the hospital for say 23 hours, they're still on observation status. They may think they've been admitted. Their insurance, what insurance pays, whether you, if you're not admitted but on observation, observation status is very different. So we wanted individuals to know, to be uh, advised by that hospital if they're put on observation status. And because that may impact whether they, if they're admitted to a nursing home or uh, Medicare and some insurances will not cover that because you have to be in the hospital at least two days you could be on observation status for two days and you're not admitted so it impacts your insurance and we wanted to make sure that uh, people knew that ahead of time another thing we did is uh, ambient that should reduce health care costs because that's really what we're looking at is ambulatory surgery centers previously you could only if you had surgery you know outpatient surgery at an ambulatory surgery center, you had to be out of there by five o'clock in the afternoon. They could only hold you for that day, not 24 hours. They could only hold you for that day. And for many people, you know, you may not have your surgery till one o'clock in the afternoon. And if you have an anesthesia problem, you may not be ready to go home by five o'clock that afternoon. So we wanted to make sure that they could hold you for a full 24 hours. And that way it gives you time to recover. Previously, you would have been transported to a hospital if you were not ready to, at five o'clock to go home, you would be admitted to the hospital. That's very expensive, drives up healthcare costs. So we said you could stay 24 hours. So you might not go home till 10 o'clock at night or you know, if it, you had your surgery at seven o'clock in the morning, you could stay till seven o'clock the next morning. So it gave you time to recuperate. We will see less hospital admissions, I believe, because of that. And another, again, impacting insurance would be, we said um, many insurance companies do what's called formularies and, and they use a term called step therapy where you have to fail first on a medication before they'll let you try the next medication. And you have to go maybe three or four medications before you get to the one that works for you. And only then would they pay for it. So we said if you are changing insurance companies and you've already been through step therapy and you don't want to do it again, you don't want to fail again and have your problem not be solved or reoccur, you do not have to go through step therapy again 
once you do it, you've done it, you found the right medication, you're on it. And if the insurance company changes the formulary kind of bait and switch, you think you've got that on that insurance company and then they change it, they, they can't do that at that point. You can change insurance companies the next year and find the right one. But once you've gone through step therapy, they can't change it for that year. So I think uh, another thing we did, this was uh, pushed very strongly by our wonderful governor, DeSantis, was really looking at the cost of medications and you know, step therapy being one of those uh, ideas. But another one is being able to import medications from Canada and other countries. And we want to be very careful how we do that because there's a lot of uh, fraudulent medications out there there you have we have the safest drug chain in the in the world and we have a very very meticulous way of making sure the medication you get is what it is intended to be the formulas are exactly as they should be they've been under the care custody and control of a licensed entity to make sure that they are kept at the right temperature, that they are not past a, a specific date when they're effective, and that there are very significant tracking and tracing of that medication. So it cannot be adulterated, diluted, or changed in any way. So we're going to, we did two levels of this. We said for, we could, um, any of our state, uh, organizations, Medicaid, DOC, Department of Corrections, anyone who receives their medication through state-funded uh, mechanism, we would put in, ACA would be, the Agency for Healthcare Administration, would be in charge of setting up a process whereby we would contract with importers to bring in medication for those individuals through, that the state contracts for, through, uh, through the Agency for Healthcare Administration, but it would have to meet all those requirements of track and trace. We'd also have to, the importers would have to post a bond. For people outside that state-funded system, we would allow importation through, and this would be under the control of the Department of Business and Professional Regulation, and that would say, you could import those drugs. We would contract with importers to do that. But again, first you have to have federal approval to do that. And you have to prove that you, it would cost less and the medication would meet all the requirements of the federal track and trace system. So that's in the process of going to uh, HHS at the federal level to get permission and then also to set up this process of track and trace. So that's still in the works. It has to come back to the legislator for final approval. Uh, we have to be notified of it and we have to fund it. So we still have control of that. And we will see where this goes. Our goal is to make sure that you get uh, prescriptions at the least expensive cost to you, but also that they are safe and efficacious and they are what they're intended to be that's where that track and trace is so so important so it was a very busy healthcare year lots of good things happening and there'll be much much more next year and i'm uh, i'm open for questions i don't know how much time i i will talk forever if you give me the microphone and I'm happy to answer any questions or go into more detail on uh, other things that I haven't touched on. Yes, sir. The question is about litigation and the cost uh, of uh, what caps, you're looking for caps on? Yes, well, 
we went down the Cap Road years ago, uh, I think it was 2004, when we had the big Med Mal crisis. And we passed, le um, passed legislation to put caps on pain and suffering. And this Florida Supreme Court threw it out. So putting caps on things can be problematic. We wound up in court over it and the Supreme Court threw out the caps. So that, that's problematic. Yes, we had, the process we've put in on assignment has been, um, I think, will hold a test of court. I think that will probably be litigated. It will probably go to, to the Supreme Court. But I believe it's very, very thoughtful and fair across the board. So we've put caps on the amount of that, uh, what those fees could be. We, in workers' comp, you know, we've tried to do the same kinds of things, and you wind up with problems. Uh, if you can avoid litigation or make it as fair as possible, I think in the long run, everybody's better off, except maybe our attorney friend over here. Yes, sir. No, it does not include long-term care. It is only hospitals, does not include nursing homes or hospices, just uh, hospitals. Further questions? Well, yes, sir. The old HRS model. He, he's heard rumored that they're going to put everything back together. You know, I've lived in Florida for 50, 60 some years. I won't tell you how long. Uh, but it is, I remember the old HRS days, you know, health and rehabilitative services. How many of you go back to HRS? Okay, if you remember HRS. And that was all kind of dissolved and broken up into the various departments because uh, it was just so bureaucratic and unwieldy. We've gone a whole different route since those days where the, the state government controlled everything. And we've gone more to a, a regionalized, diversified system that I happen to think works better. I would hate to see us go back to that kind of uh, classic big bureaucracy that was HRS. Uh, I think we're much better off keeping it departmentalized, although this is where I have been very involved in really looking at this from the IT perspective. And one of the things we did this year, which has moved us in the right direction, is that we have siloed thinking when it comes to uh, sharing data and spending money on data, spending money on uh, information technology, on IT. We now have put all, we have started within the, the um, we've started the Division of State Technology. So we are now going to have everything under management or Department of Management Services so that they will look across the enterprise at purchases of health, of IT, but also, and this is where I have been pushing on interoperability among agencies, so that in healthcare, for instance, and I, the data that you were collecting in ACA is consistent and you can have an individual personal identifier in child welfare in mental health, in criminal justice, so that you can really, we know what we're spending, uh, but we also know, we also can use information across agencies. I'll give you an example, the Department of Health. We have various registries that physicians have to send information to. If you have HIV, if if you have when you get your shots, we have a called something called shots registry, vaccinations. 
you have to that information goes into a database they don't talk to each other so we don't know we probably have a hundred different registries they don't even use the same format for first name last name whatever so they they don't interoperate and they don't talk to each other so that's a big mission I happen to be on is data governance so that we can have a consistency across the enterprise and be able to share data to really look at outcomes and make appropriate decisions as policymakers, but also for the benefit of the person so that we know what services they're getting and that the, it's the best service for them. So uh, I hope we don't go down that road of HRS. <laughs> I, uh, I would much rather have a, a diversified system meeting the needs of people in their communities. Yes, sir. Yes, background checks is a classic example. Well, we do now have a consortium. I think it's ACA runs it that you can, that the clearinghouse. Yes, we do have a clearinghouse for background checks. So we're getting better. We're getting better. I hope I'm pushing them even further. Further. Any other questions? Well, once again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. And mostly, I want to say thank you for what you do in our community each and every day. You are, you are those out there in the nonprofit world serving our most vulnerable, whether it's the disabled, whether it is the, uh, in, you know, our senior citizens. You are out there doing what's important. And we as government, want to enable you that should be my role is to enable you to do the good work that you do each and every day so i thank you for what you do and appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and share it with you thank you senator harrell and karen who's with us today as well they they as you can tell she knows more about this process than dawson and i could ever learn but we'll try um, and thank you for making the trip over here